And we are live. How is everyone doing this evening? Good, good. Pretty good. Pretty yeah. excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ellen, what is this, our fifth month doing it? Uh, I think so. About, yeah, approximately. Yeah, it's, it's been far. going well. You know, I know I, there was. It's oh, been actually so really, it's a lot easier, actually. <laughs> it, it's yeah, there's that. that. I can like shower, you know, 30 minutes before I get on the subway for now. Right. Without doing it, when I do it, when we do it live, I'm always stressed that I have to say hello to everybody and make everyone feel comfortable and take pictures. <clears throat> and I don't have to do that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, even after the pandemic. I'd like to do some type of streaming. I don't know if we're going to use this particular platform, but uh, you know, I might just, I have an old phone that I might just hook up and, you know, prop up there and stream it to YouTube directly. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it depends on the, uh, on the That'd audience be cool. like that. Um, you know, cause like if people don't have the rights to, uh, to podcast or, or whatever, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean like we're, we're getting viewers from all over the world. It's cool. Well, no, and, I think that and, now, and now able to get readers from all over the world for the time yeah. being. Yep. <laughs> Including Mr. Rose. Hello from Switzerland. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, the original plan was that I was going to be in New York with you guys yeah. right. on this date. Right. But, yeah. I was, I, I was, I was just, just thinking that. The window, show us outside, show us the mountains, yeah. but it is dark over there. It well, there's uh, the mountains are not visible from here, although they were when we yeah called earlier last week. I was in the yeah, mountains. Right, it's really late over there. Isn't it? I'm back in the flatland, and it is night, so Midnight. you would see. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking, I don't really miss those stairs going up to the bar. Uh, I do kind of miss the opportunity to be sitting at the table with Ben <laughs> and, and uh, you yeah. know, being like, hey, I'll give you a copy of my book if you'll give me one of yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'll <laughs> buy you know, that kind of yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now those so, stairs are pretty horrible, um, especially if you, you know, um, can't get up them. Like if, <laughs> if you uh, are in a wheelchair or something, it's it's uh, not accessible at all. There's no elevator. It's mm -hmm. a really old building. Um, so yeah, I want, that's one of the great things about this is like people, uh, anyone can can watch. Um, so we don't have that many viewers yet, but we're ten minutes early from the schedule. Right. Um, but I like the surprise yeah. that people come on like, wait, what? I missed everything. No, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> We're just hanging out, yeah. Uh, Who do you see? Well, well, like I said, I, I was trying to tweet for people to come look, but Twitter wouldn't let me because I'm, oh, because I'm, I'm verified, so I'm in Twitter jail now. Apparently. Right, so, Twitter yeah. jail. <laughs> I, I tweeted everybody. I tweeted and yeah. yeah yeah, more people pay attention to you anyway. So, so. so did they say why it was just the verified accounts or no? Yeah. Yeah. So, but why was it just verified, did they say? Because that's how they hacked it. Someone mm. hacked mm. those accounts. Yeah, there's probably someone with the super user. Mm. Super admin. Oh, we have Mike Zipster who's joining us. Hello. And Melanie hey. joining us. Hello, Melanie. Hey, I see people. Right. Yeah, hey. so you guys probably can see those comments coming by on the right side. Right. Um, I was afraid I went Twitter jail. I can see them. Yeah, yeah. I wrote to Trump saying "f you, Trump," and someone said, "You, they're going to put you in Twitter jail." I said, "Well, if they do, they do," but they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it out loud. You know, the whole thing. I just said "f you." Well, that's that's not a bad reason to be in Twitter jail. I didn't think so. No, but someone said you may they may put you in because someone else said, "Well, I said this, and they put me in Twitter jail." Temporary. Hold on one sec. I'll be right back. So I don't know what, I can't remember what the other person had said. They said he should do something. And I don't remember what he was supposed to do. <laughs> you know, it was, was this. whatever it was. I try to keep it polite enough not to get thrown into Twitter jail. <laughs> There's some, sure. there's some joke here about civil disobedience and like tweet from a Birmingham jail. <laughs> 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 And here's we'll, Jack. We'll, we'll laugh at the idea of the oh, joke. Jack. Hello, you're going to bite me again? Jack, no. You already bit oh, no. me. 
<laughs> now the, I understand the Ellen, card. I don't think we were live. Did you want to show everyone your your wound that your cat just? Yeah, I've got a band aid. Mean kitty. Oh, you have a band aid on it now. Yeah, it was it was a vampire bite. Wait, that's right. I can't get the angle. Oh, I see the band aid. Well, I, I can see the band aid. The blood right. around the band aid too. Yeah. Top part. Yeah. Jack bit me. Everybody. He didn't. I wasn't paying attention. Bad kid. And when he does his tail, he's he doesn't want to be petted anymore. And I forget <laughs> it before I kind of ignore that. And it's a big mistake when I do. Right, Jack? Oops. He's lunging. I can't trust uh -oh. him. All right, I forget it. Forget it. I hate you. <laughs> ben, you were supposed to, what days were you supposed to be in uh, New York? Uh, I think this is, I think we, I think we, did we keep the original date? I feel like, I, yeah. cause it's right after ReaderCon. No, no, I, I, mean, I was I, I right. mean for this reading. Yeah, the reading is the same yeah. date, but, but I mean, yeah. I think your, your trip was, was it like a book tour? Were you traveling? Yeah, I think the original idea was I was going to go to ReaderCon and then, you know, oh, we okay. would do a, a book tour and make our way around okay. to different places. I was actually going to, um, road trip with Marianne Mohanraj. Oh yeah. I'm promoting your cookbook. I'm really sad I, about ReaderCon. I had ReaderCon. the same plan. Yeah, me too. Yeah. No, you were going to yeah. pick with, with Mary Marianne, Marianne Mohawk, yeah. Mike? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's not a bad way to do it. I would have been with Nicole Corner Stace. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Mike, yeah. you're in Massachusetts, right? I'm sorry, what? We are in Massachusetts. Where are you? I live in Virginia. Well, yeah. Why do you think <laughs> Massachusetts? I don't know why. Like, I'm a, I always think you're a Massachusetts person. Okay. No, well, it, probably because that's where you see me. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I drive up to Massachusetts to actually do publishing related things because okay. here and I actually live in far southwest Virginia and you know huh. there there are science fiction people here but it, it's, Hi, not, it's not it's not the Kelly. same yeah, yeah. what oh, what hey hey Kelly Kelly's taking a break from writing she meant I made her do it on Twitter oh hey <laughs> good way to good reason you to made, take a break you made a writer oh, stop so. writing yeah. Ellen what's yeah. going on? <laughs> what you made a writer stop writing? You, you told Kelly? Take a break and watch Oh, oh okay. <laughs> she says, love you. <laughs> love you too. Um, Kelly, Jack bit me before we went live because I aggravated me. Mean, him. mean kitty. So. Let me. Uh, I actually didn't put back to trace and all. I should have, but I put hydrogen peroxide. Actually. Yeah. No, no, I'm just playing around with that. You know, it's oh. bells and whistles. I like to t play around with this stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's pretty fun, which I'm sure hard. is why my, part of why my laptop can't handle it. Oh, it's all the scrolling and, <laughs> yes. Oh, and Ellen is waiting for the story. So you're waiting for a story from Kellen, Kelly. Oh, but is, oh, it, oh, is this for me? Oh, okay, cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm oh. Kidding. Still get interrupted. All right, just don't forget where it was going. <laughs> <laughs> it's at the climax. I know. Right. Presumably, she'll know where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess maybe it's it'll not, be different. I, if you're playing, if you're playing hooky with your editor, is that playing hooky? I don't guess it is. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have been uh watching the uh the previous uh months have you have you watched any of the series i i'm i must admit that i have not seen the previous ones it, it oh, isn't because yeah, of yeah. lack Look, of interest hey, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 how, 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 how dare i interlope <laughs> i think that's michael link come because he's doing it and next month and i Told him he should. He might want to drop by to check it out, see how it works. Yeah. Oh, look. So he said he'd try. I don't know if he will. I actually didn't know that you'd gone virtual until uh, until recently. When I, you know, when we started talking about uh, when I realized this date was rescheduled, I. I uh... Yeah, it's it's actually gone really yeah. well. I mean, uh, you know, knock on wood, we haven't really had any issues. You know, once or twice, a couple cool. of. Uh, uh, like hiccups, with, you know, technology, but usually we iron that out before the live thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. great. Yeah, I, I have the excuse that, uh, you know, Wednesday nights are normally when my arts column uh, has to be turned in for my day job. Mm. Uh, I happen to be on 
I happen to be on vacation this week because oh. this is the week I would ordinarily. This is well. The plan was to go to ReaderCon and and then mm-hmm. come to KGP, like like Ben was just yeah. talking about. But uh, I've ended up just taking the week off and staying home. And you know, Anita had surgery last week, so I've been you know taking okay. care of her. And, uh, okay. But, okay. She is. I mean, she is doing well. I think she's actually. I think I think she's actually outside in our garden right now, which she's really not supposed to be doing. But I can't stop her. <laughs> <laughs> she's seizing the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm glad that I, we can still do the KGB thing at least. I'm very sad about ReaderCon. Hi, Amy. Uh, hey, yeah. Amy. Hey, Matt. This is totally working. Yeah, a little time, yeah. Amy. Oh, great! You're seeing the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the the only drawback for me right now is like I keep forgetting I need to be looking at my phone, so I keep looking down here, and I'm sure it looks strange. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we yeah. So we we started a, a fireplace garden. We have a few herbs. I have a uh, nice uh, uh, basil. Um, Parsley, dill, uh, a few others. I don't know. Chi- I had I grew these chives years. It was I don't know. I was growing something in the pot in this pot outside, and it had all these crazy flies. Like Thank these, you, Kelly. I don't know if they were fruit flies. I don't know what kind of. They weren't fruit flies. They were like maybe gnats. I don't know. But it was like swarming. So I I read something online, and I stupidly didn't like think twice about it. They were like, oh, just pour vinegar on it. Oh. So like. Mm. That, that's basically like pouring salt on, on, on the ground. Like you salt the earth. So like, I just did it in the center. There's like this one spot in the pot that just stopped growing. But like the sides, these chives grew really, really tall. So I was like, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna die in the winter. And like, the, this is the third season. They just they just keep, I don't understand how they're, they survive the winter. They just- well, I've been buying- chives. Those are sturdy. I've been buying yeah. chives with cucumbers and yogurt. And, yeah. Yeah. and not chives, I'm sorry, dill. Dill Drives and, of doom. No, no, yeah. dill and garlic. Dill. I'm every time I do it, I try it differently. I think the last one I put too much garlic in actually, and not enough dill. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard. You have to just I just judge it by taste. Yeah, and then um, a couple people. Um, I'll be back just a second. Yeah, no problem. Really, like coincidentally, two different people offered me garlic. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not at the same time, but like someone, uh, it's garlic on a farm. Um, they sent me like their varietal garlic, which was really good, but super potent. Like you just put a dab mm. in and it was like blew us away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, uh, yeah. Really cheap. One of those fruit stands. Like, then we got like three yeah. bulbs from Buck, which is pretty good. Yeah. I don't like that much. Like, I'm never going to use it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it depends on what you use the garlic for, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Ellen? I didn't hear that last. It depends on what you use the garlic for. She said never too much garlic. Oh, oh, oh. Someone wants to know when we're starting. Uh, 10 I minutes. agree. Well, yeah, I have the banner now. It's, readings will start at 7, 10 p.m. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, TIC Summer Camp. <laughs> My old employer. From oh, when I was okay. 16. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Well, Welcome. not that person. That's, the that's probably Emily. Hi, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> Her predecessor. <laughs> nice. Actually, and my daughter's current employer. Oh. How old is your daughter now? She's 19. Oh, boy. Goodness. <clears throat> I remember when all these Children were babies. Yep, they are big now. Yeah, that's right. Actually, she, my, I believe my daughter may be the youngest attendee of Clarion West. She was there when she was like four months old. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> and and what was what were her stories like? Yeah, what, how, many, <laughs> how many did she turn in? I remember them well. They started with Bob Ga Well, I don't know. I but yeah. possi- I, what I did were you? She she definitely was there. She was there for a, a couple of the of the weeks, and you were you were my instructor, Alan. But I don't know if uh, Viva was still around or if she'd left or if my wife had left her. I don't know. That I don't remember. <laughs> 
but yes, she was she was held by Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. 2001. In answer to the the the, the chat question. Yeah, if you haven't noticed by now, um, the YouTube live stream, there's a slight delay. Maybe it depends on, on uh, <laughs> the power of the computers, but uh, it's probably uh, 10 or 30 seconds. So if we, if we um, you know, don't respond right away, it's because of that. Benjamin, Ben, did you see the note from TIC? Yes, Not that's my mom. Hi, mom. Oh. <laughs> mom. Oh, all right. It's my mom using Emily's account. Wow. Or not Emily. Well, hello, Ben. You can't change the name. Hi, Michael. Now, now the pressure's really on, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Leland's here, so you can see how it works. It looks great. It'll okay. be cool. Oh, hey. You're gonna, he's going to hey. be on next month. Excellent. Oh, cool. Cool. He'll actually be prepared, unlike me. <laughs> uh, for those who are, as, who are asking, we're, we're going to start around uh, 10 after 7. Uh, PM Eastern time. If you're not joining us from uh, from New York, um, yeah. So in about five minutes or so, we're just waiting for more people to join us. Uh, we have about 15 viewers at the moment. There so are going on tonight, I remember. I just noticed there was something. Ken Lu and someone else are doing something at some bookstore virtually tonight. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the great thing about YouTube is like, even if you can't watch it live, it's it's up there and then people come back and, and see it. So like, sure. usually yeah. we'll get like another couple hundred views after the reading as well, which is cool. And then we also uh, podcast this. So um, for those who just want the audio, um, there's that, which we were doing before the, the pandemic, but right, right. might as well continue. Yeah. yeah. Is, is Gordon Linsner still involved in that? Or is... oh, yeah, he hasn't shown. I don't know if he's come to these, but yes, he does it. He does the um, recording at the library. Yeah, he, he provides us with the uh, the raw audio, cool. and then like I add an intro and outro. Uh, well, yeah. actually, Raj and uh, Kana recorded that for us. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, yeah. You think gotta... about thinking of moving away? Did you say, did... Who indeed, oh, Angus? Yeah, you've got to shut out your hat, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, phone. no, we don't. I, I, I got this at a concert, by the way. This, this we go was to an awesome concert. Think, Michael, <laughs> we don't go to Veselka. It's you can't get reservations. We go to a. We go to. We've been going to the kitchen sink. The kitchen sink, which is a diner, which it's, has everything except pork chops. Yeah, <laughs> except pork soup dumplings. So, so Mac, so. You know, Raj plans to move away. He's thinking. I saw that. I saw that he was thinking about Ulster County, which is I love it up there. It's uh, right. upstate New York. Live there. Come on. What'd you say? But who wants to live there? I mean, be real. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know, Ellen. When I do, you know that New Yorker poster where it's like how New Yorkers see the world. <laughs> like New York, and then there's like you know the Hudson, yeah, East, right, the right, Hudson right. River, and then True. you know yeah. the rest of the country, California. Like, that's how that's how you see. It's true. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I could I could totally live in, when a, I went in the to college, I I went to Albany State, and I assumed that everybody there would move to Manhattan afterwards because why would they not? You know, I mean, I knew right. I was going to from Yonkers. It's like that's everyone's goal to move to Manhattan, and yeah. that most I don't think anyone who I knew, none of my friends, were even planning on moving to Manhattan, and it was kind of shocking because to me that was like the the end, you know, the end, mm -hmm. whatever you call it, wherever would the ultimate, wherever it would end up. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's still shocking to me that people don't want to move to Manhattan. Well, a lot of my uh, childhood friends um, live within five miles of where they grew up um, and have it. And yeah, I was kind of surprised that they didn't move away. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I could totally live in the Catskills. We, we uh, my wife and I, Try to go up there several times a year. Um, I know. I mean, it's pretty. I like it, but I'm too social to want to live up there. And oh, I you can still come back to the city. You could still, you know, it's two hours away. Yeah, right. It's two hours away, right? Which means I'd be happy to visit for two hours and go someplace for a weekend. But I do not want to live in the country. All right. <laughs> Each his own. So we have about twenty oh, viewers. Chance or Angus? Oh, there. Uh, I I saw I saw the Who in Richmond, not in Brooklyn. 
but you know, br br brotherhood and who in who worship. <laughs> how how locked down is New York now at this point? We're all yeah, wearing. I loved it up. Everybody's wearing masks. I'm yeah. sitting outside. I mean, there it's like it's like Italy. It's wonderful. I mean, the streets outside have restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like it's restaurants just are open. like walking down the street in Italy. In any no, I mean you can't go inside. You can all, there's only outdoor seating. Oh, yeah. Sidewalks. Uh -huh. But they all, they all like have. they all took over the sidewalks and oh okay. Like, and built these like down. I mean, you know, park in park park and it's just lovely. I mean, it was down a quiet street. All these tables, you know, uh -huh. to each other. No cars. It was just lovely. Yeah, you know? it, is, yeah. it is. I mean, other than the fact that. That you can't go inside. Yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. theater, you won't, can't go to the movies. You can't go on an airplane. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's really kind of lovely. Did yeah. you, um, Mike, did you see what Michael's saying? About uh, your bookshelf? He said about your bookshelf. Oh, <laughs> we have the same book though. Do you, by by neatly organized? Do you mean not organized at all? <laughs> what, is that, what is that thing on top? Is that a picture? Mike? Um, a griffin or something? What is that? Is yeah. that a seal? That okay? That that is a that is a woodcut of a creature called a piasaw. Oh, and yeah. it's it's oh. actually it's it's actually a creature I used in one of my stories, and there's this whole sort of there's there's this whole sort of uh, curious backstory to it, like mm -hmm. like there were claims that it's from Native American legend, and there's like this big mural of it okay. in Pennsylvania, but yeah. then there's like but then there's like further then there's like further information that sort of casts doubt on it. It's, 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 oh. Okay. So, like there was a white guy who made the whole thing up. Probably. Yeah, but that's what it is. <laughs> oh, that sounds yeah. nice, Amy. Yeah. Oh, and Kelly, yeah, and Kelly, yeah. I'm more boat in Brooklyn Bridge Park. That sounds lovely. I'm only okay. going to go out. I only go out with one person at a time, though. I won't go out with more than one person because I think you can't keep three. You know. I'm yeah. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, should we start? It's time. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and start? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB, our, we think, fifth virtual reading um, of our long-running series. Welcome. Most of you, well, well, actually, most of you don't, or some of you aren't able to come because you don't live in Manhattan or come to this neighborhood. But so we're from, you know, now we can get people from around the world viewing this and even getting them on the show without them coming here, which is kind of great. Um, anyway, it's been at the KGB bar, which used to be a socialist hangout decades ago. Um, and it was a club, a social club. And then it became a bar and it's still called, it's KGB is named after Crane's Bar. Wait, Crane no. Gallery Bar. Thank you. Crane Gallery Bar. Um, Crane is K-R-A-I-N-E, and I don't know if that was someone's name or not, I don't know, but anyway, there's a theater downstairs from the bar that is the Crane's Theater, and then upstairs is something called the Red Room, which now has like a cabaret, although of course it's closed for the duration, you know, we have no idea how long it's going to be closed, but anyway, so um, Matt and I have been hosting it for, since well, when, around 2000? Uh, you, you, you've been hosting it since, uh, what, 2003 or so? And uh, I've been hosting it since 2008 with you. Something like that, yeah. So, and we've been doing this, and it's fun. And it's actually, it's a different experience from doing it in person, but it's actually a lot of fun. And as I was saying before you all came on, to me, it's a lot less, um, oh, I'm looking at someone's quote. It, it's a lot less stressful because when I do it in person, I run around taking pictures and trying to make sure everyone has drinks and everything. And now I don't have to do that. So it's kind of, interesting but anyway welcome yeah. all of you and um our first oh before i announce our first reader we have um we are scheduled to the end of the year and we're assuming that we're going to be virtual through the end of the year we have no idea what's going on after that so we don't have anything scheduled quite yet but august 19th we have michael liebling and elizabeth hand september 16th craig gidney and olivia llewellyn October 21st, Joe Hill and Laird Barron. November 18th, Cat Rambo and William Gibson. And December 16th, Justin Key and Priya Sharma. 
uh, Priya lives in England, so she'll be going first because she's actually a full-time medical doctor and has to get up early in the morning. So anyway, that's what we have coming up to the end of the year. And our first reader tonight is Mike Allen, who has twice been a finalist for the World Fantasy Award. His horror tales are gathered in the Shirley Jackson Award-nominated collection on seeming and in his newest book, Aftermath of an Industrial Accident. <clears throat> his novella, The Comforter, sequel to his Nebula Award-nominated Button Bin, just appeared in the anthology, A Sinister Quartet. By day, he writes the arts column for the Roanoke, Virginia Times. Please welcome Mike Allen. Gosh, thank you, Ellen. Um, oh, sorry. Oh. So uh, I'm gonna start by reading from uh, Aftermath of an Industrial Accident, which is my, my newest, it's my third collection of short stories and my second collection of horror stories, and it came out last week. Uh, and I'm gonna begin with a small piece of flash fiction, though many people have described it as a poem that opens the book that's a bit personal. It's called Six Waking Nightmares Poe Gave Me in Third Grade. At night, the light fixture above my bed stretched into a pale blue vulture eye and the emaciated ghost of the man it belonged to swirled out, craggy face contorted in silent accusation as he reached for me, but I didn't dare turn my head for fear of the man with the toothsome smile who would emerge from my closet and disassemble himself like a thing made of paper tabs and glue, and what he would look like as he kept crawling toward me. Yet, if I shut my eyes, the old man would never leave me alone. The pounding I heard, not the pulse of blood in my ears, but the beat of his heart, thumping, 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 as he lay dismembered beneath my bed. And if I kept my eyes shut, I would feel the deadly rush of air as that long curved blade swung from above, swept lower and lower as I lay wrapped and trapped in my blankets. I could never ever sleep. And if I did, I would wake up buried faceless men dumping dirt on me from above as I screamed in my coffin, smothered and alone with the gold bugs that bit and the death watch beetles and hideous throngs of conqueror worms. But none of it mattered, no matter how many nights I stayed awake and afraid, because soon the great raven that hid in every shadow would pluck out my pale and fluttering soul. And I knew then that I would never more see happiness or heaven. So that's how that book starts out. And I picked uh, some excerpts from another story a little later in the book to also share with you uh, that kind of continues the Corvidy theme, the, 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 the Raven theme, and it's called The Cruelest Team Will Win. A spider with a leg span wider than my outstretched hand squeezed out from the space behind the light switch and spread its wings. I froze, my finger still on the toggle. Behind me, the dust-draped ceiling fan hummed to life, the light bulb beneath it flicking on to paint the monster with my shadow. The marks on its body formed a single staring eye above a screaming mouth. Two more false eyes glared red across its dragonfly wings. Another hideous little soul turned demonic, yearning to grow into something far worse. I showed it my own spirit form. It made good on its threat and lifted into the air, but its terrifying modification only made my task easier and my beak closed around it. The poison leaking from its crushed body spread warmth as it slid down my gullet. The first time I ate one of its kind, that poison made me quite sick. I underestimated how sick. I told my sweet neighbor across the hall that her three-year-old wouldn't wake up screaming anymore. Her apartment was safe again. 
Minutes later, I drove to work at the fabric store, nearly crashed my car just trying to park, staggered inside and barely made it to the bathroom stall, dry heaving over the toilet while my manager clucked behind me, Leanne, are you okay? You need the hospital? But when you eat a ghost, there's nothing to throw up. And the kind of poison a tainted soul puts in you, no doctor can help with that. So I told her I'd be fine. It was just food poisoning. I'd be over it soon. I couldn't go home. I needed the money too much. So I sucked it up and headed out to the sales floor. And then I found out something else about the poison. When the nausea subsided, subsided a euphoria kicked in not far removed from the time I mixed flexural and peach snops, a lava lamp glow oozing through me. All day I fought the urge to take my blue jay form right there in the store. My wings, slices of sky, would stretch longer than the fabric tables, and then I'd fly right through the ceiling like a ghost gone giant size, meld my blue with the blue above. I did that once, a couple years ago, when I was less weighted with sad knowledge of the world, quit a job at a print shop by going Blue Jay right in front of my skeevy boss and flapping away through the cinder block wall into the shimmering heavens of the spirit world. But when I returned to Earth again, I still needed to pay for my classes, to cover my rent, to eat. That sad weight kept me grounded that first delirious day of spider poisoning, but the sensation was addictive. The very next time I was asked to cleanse a house, I found another spiderling. It was strange that I found another right away and not a run-of-the-mill, perfectly human-looking haint, but it shot out at me from under a closet door, its mutation a second set of legs tipped with pincers, and I didn't hesitate to eat it. And the next one I found, and the next one, and the next, and many nexts since, and this time too. The urge hit my brain straight away to stay as I was, shift completely into the spirit world and rise up through the floors and ceiling of this rambling house as if it were mere mirage and soar at the noonday sky like an ocean dive in defiance of gravity. But I had already collected my upfront fee from the charming elderly couple that lived there and now I needed to collect the rest of it. Classes, rent, normal non-ghosty food. I didn't charge a lot, but it would at least give the debt dog a bone to run off with and chew on. Emma Manderley was a frequent customer at the fabric store who knew about my specialty in clearing malevolent influences. The word gets around, you know, among those who care about such things. And the Manderleys had just enough sensitivity between them that they would know the thing that had bedeviled their sleep was gone without my even needing to say so. They were waiting in their station wagon, sitting in the driveway with the radio playing. I had told them I only needed a few minutes. My magic never took more than a few minutes. I looked forward to their relieved smiles. My brain buzzing pleasantly from the poison I climbed the spiral stairs out of the musty basement, traipsed through the slightly less musty ground floor, and glanced out the front window as I crossed the living room. The station wagon was completely blanketed by a substance like dense strands of shimmering gauze. A slender woman in slate gray business attire, knee-length skirt, and matching jacket was striding up the front walk. I didn't slow, didn't want to linger in the window where she could spot me. I leaned to spy through the front door peephole. I've known since I was a little girl that there are other people like me. My parents weren't spirit folk, but my father's sister was. Not a blue jay like me, but a raven. She taught me how to be who I am and to be wary of others who do what I do. See, you might wonder why I don't spend all day, all of my time, as a bird. And this is why. Our world of meat, metal, and bone is a dangerous place, but the spirit world is a hundred times worse, filled with predators. No laws, no one to make the cruel rein in their appetites. 
Ghosts are our natural prey in our animal forms, and they can be dangerous enough. Though, before I started finding the spiderlings, it used to be that if I rooted out a ghost, I could just order it to leave, and it would flee because it knew what I was and what I could do. But there's many out there don't limit themselves to just ghosts. I could tell right away this woman had a spirit shadow. It loomed dark around her in my second sight, even though the day was bright. White streaks flared from the temples of her page boy to frame the narrow face, split by sensuous, disproportionately wide lips. She could have been 20 or 60, her features smooth but not youthful. Behind her, a single strand of blue spider web Excuse me. Behind her, a single strand of blue spiderweb rose straight into the sky, and behind that I recognized the same webbing, cocooning the station wagon and the poor couple inside it. The driver's side door was ajar, bound that way by the webbing. I wasn't going to get my paycheck. The woman stepped onto the porch, raising her fist as if she intended to knock. Her dark eyes narrowed, and I had a second to realize she was staring right at me through the door. I leaped back and stretched my wings. She changed too, her fangs missing my head by less than an inch as she phased right through the wood. A spider, large as a minibus, legs longer than my wings, glared at me with eight eyes like black pearls embedded in coal shiny hide. Her form flowed straight through the walls of the house as if they weren't there, just like mine did as I beat my wings in thunderous panic, shoving as much air between us as I could, my heart shrieking with fear. I fully flapped into the land of spirits, leaving behind the world of flesh. Surrounded by the sourceless silver light of the spirit realm, I risked a look back and discovered the spider had followed me, clambering after me at terrifying speed on her single strand of blue thread. I should have easily left her far behind, but the thread moved of its own accord. Its anchor point, somewhere out of sight, high in the heavens, kept pace with me as I flew, matching my maneuvers. I risked a plunge right at it, meaning to snip it in half with my beak. It dodged me, then sprang back, and I bet if I hadn't ducked so quickly myself, it would have looped around me, and worse, the spider picked up her already impossible pace. She called after me in a shockingly honey-sweet voice. Birds eat spiders, but spiders eat birds, too. She didn't have to run anymore. She was level with me, merely had to ride her magic thread until I tired out. I knew what was hunting me, who she was. My Aunt Audra told me stories about the Night Queen in the Silver City, who favors drawn-out death, who only ever pretends to show mercy because she loves to watch her victims' hopes die before their final agonies begin. She calls herself Lilith, my auntie said, but she's not that Lilith. They say a couple hundred years ago she was human, but no one calls her that now. I couldn't get away. Not just because I, I couldn't shake Lilith's magic thread, but because out there in the ceaseless silver light, here and there and there, I started to see the shadows suspended in the air, things with too many legs emerging from the physics-defying passages that, in the spirit world, are as numerous a mile in the air as they are a mile underground. More creatures like Lilith, at least a dozen, not as big as her, but bigger than me. Not close enough to catch me. Not yet. It was just a matter of time before my constant swooping to keep out of reach of the Night Queen put me in range of one of her clan. I could only think of one thing to do. I didn't have to fake the quaver in my voice. Your Highness, what have I done to upset you? How droll that you know me, she said. 
Someone of your kind should stick to acorns. You keep murdering my pets. Pets? The spiderlings? Those strange mutant ghost things that invade homes of the mundanes and drive them crazy with nightmares? My stomach lurched at the thought of killing anyone's pet, a terrible guilt twisting through me the instant before my rational side tamped it down. Lilith could not mean that term of endearment the same way as you or I would mean it. The Night Queen grieves for no one. I continued to avoid her, though, as the old joke goes, boy, were my arms tired. Those weird little ghosts? Why would you care about them? My dear, those weren't ghosts. Surely you could tell by the taste. But I had never eaten a ghost before that spiderling across the hall attacked me. How many ghosts had Lilith devoured over her long lifetime? I couldn't imagine. I gave her a version of the truth. I, I thought it was their mutation. I've heard of spirits changing themselves, mutilating themselves, trying to become demons. Lilith laughed, the sound grotesquely emphasized with a waving of her fangs. Stupid child, it's our kind who does that, chooses to modify the forms we're born in. Ghosts have no such power. And surely Lilith knew what she was talking about as the living, breathing, supreme example. Tasty as ghosts are, though, I have found that the little human flies make for finer dining while they're still alive. I've been experimenting, indulging my culinary skills, figuring out the best method to sup from many of them all at once. I couldn't help myself. Oh, no. Her voice brightened with mirth. You have been eating tiny little pieces of me. I might then have simply folded my wings together, dropped like Icarus, and hoped quick death on jagged rocks waited below. I was so, so fucked. And I'm going to be horrible and leave you all on that cliffhanger. You have to get the book to figure out what happens next. Uh, all right. I, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. I'm not done yet. All right. Uh, um, We're still but, clapping. We're still yeah, laughing. Yeah, I'm glad you're clapping. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share one more very tiny bit from Aftermath. Uh, I have a, a, a very strange short story in Aftermath of an Industrial Accident called Burn the Cool Kids at the Stake. You can guess what that title might mean. But the opening paragraph is one of my favorite one of my favorites that I've ever come up with, and it's very short. Michelle says, nobody's going to die tonight. She puts her squat silver revolver right up against Darren's temple, and you're nobody. And that is the opening paragraph of that story. <laughs> um, I have, because... You know, be, be, because I am a very unwise writer publisher, I released a second book during this pandemic, uh, A Sinister Quartet. Uh, this is an anthology that contains four, well, three novellas and a complete short novel by World Fantasy Award winner uh, C.S.E. Cooney, uh, who, if you're not familiar with her work, my God, you should be seeking it out. Uh, it also contains a. Um, it, 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 I, I see the. I, I see the. The clap, clap, love it. Thank you so much. Uh, it. It. It also contains a novella by me called The Comforter, which is the threequel to the horror story that begins. Well, began I guess in two thousand and seven with my story, The Button Bin, that was a Nebula Award finalist and was continued with a novella called The Quilt Maker that appeared in my horror collection um, Un Unseeming, which was a Shirley Jackson Award finalist. Um, 
And uh, the comforter continues that story and it picks up with some of the characters who were introduced in the quilt maker. And I'm going to use the, the rest of my minutes, which I have a shocking amount of time left, or maybe this thing just stopped. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, I'm going to share two short chapters from the quilt maker and then I will be done. Uh, the first chapter uh, picks up with a young girl named Maddie who was introduced in, uh, who was introduced in the quilt maker. And it goes, Maddie unfolds the note. She usually finds them stuck to the underside of her desk. She hasn't given much thought to how they adhere there, though where they come from, though when they come free, she's never noticed glue or anything else that would make the odd textured paper sticky. The precise little squares feel like suede, and the words at first glance look like they're stitched on in black thread, though on closer inspection, the effect is more that of a tattoo. Maddie hasn't figured out how the optical illusion works. This new one reads, in crude block letters, how you and me are kin. My mom stole your mom's skin. She glances at the teacher whose eyes are locked on his laptop screen. He is scowling, his goatee and shaggy dark hair giving him the look of a deeply offended beatnik, but that's just Mr. Newman's normal expression. He's a man with resting bitch face. Her desk is strategically positioned, black back corner nearest the door. She quick scans the rest of the class. Most are pondering the algebra questions displayed on their tablets with varying degrees of absorption or frustration. None are focused on her. She quick grabs her bright pink backpack, stuffs this newest note into the outer pouch where she stowed all the others. She started getting them the day they came back from Christmas break. One came loose from the underside of the desk as she doodled in her algebra textbook, fluttered down to a light like a leaf on her bare leg. It read, found you on one side and I know where your parents are on the other. Others followed, not every day, but sometimes several days in a row, always and only in this classroom under this desk. You should be me, and I should be you. My mother will stitch us together. I like how you draw skulls. Draw one on the desk. With a fingertip, Maddie traces the still smudged outlines of the skull she sketched in pencil, someone else's attempt to erase it, not quite finishing the job. She hasn't figured out who is leaving the notes. Her class with Mr. Newman is second period, a group of supposedly smart eighth graders. First period is Mr. Newman's free period. The third period class is a smaller group of advanced placement seventh graders. She's tried hanging out late to spy, but so far as she can tell, no one sits in her desk. The little teacher's pets all cluster in the front. Later periods, she can't make it across the building in time to have a peek without being late for class. Whoever is making these, she know, they know she shouldn't exist. She wants to meet them, ask why she's alive. And then this last bit, another short chapter, the very next chapter, actually chapter three, resumes with a child named Davy, also first introduced in the quilt maker. And I'm gonna share with you folks a small spoiler. He is the one leaving the notes. Your mother tested you and you failed. You push with all your might in all directions. The box your mother has sealed you inside is the size of a large suitcase. You can't force it open, though you are stronger than a platoon of Marines. You howl and howl with as many mouths. Like your many arms, your howls stay inside the box. It's not your first time trapped in the box. Its walls are transparent. Your many eyes take in all the familiar sights. Above you loom the struts that support the box spring of your mother's king-size bed. 
Below you is a carpet splotched with dark brown stains. Beside you, a centipede crawls, the vibrations of your struggles causing its undulating legs to quicken their pace. You were thinking about something else when she came into your room. It's not the first time she's caught you off guard. She demands you remain alert in all directions, outward and inward, as she has learned to be. But the last time she punished you, this harshly was many months ago. You have to understand that our kind can be hurt, she has said. You have to understand we have weaknesses. Remember what your father used to say to you? Stay alert, stay alive. Your father suffered a, face, a fate worse than death at the hands of your mother. She laughs when she talks about it, and she loves to talk about it. You learn to laugh with her. Any other reaction, she might coil around you like a snake made of sheets and stuff you in the box. But she hasn't talked about your father in months. You did notice something new, though, a glitch in the lovely mask she, in the lovely mask she put so much effort into maintaining. She and you were play-acting yet another family dinner when you noticed how her face, her neck, the tawny skin across her collarbone sagged loose like wet paper. What's wrong, Mom? Nothing, she snapped as her skin contracted to its proper texture. Your mother did something to fortify the box, to enchant it. There are symbols scratched into the transparent surface. You are seeing them up close and in reverse. You have no idea what they mean or how she learned them. There is something else you have done, something else that might have sparked her fury, but she doesn't know about it. She can't. You don't know how many hours have passed. You are no longer focused on these what ifs in any rational way. They loop through your mind as you howl. You should not have panicked. What little air was sealed in with you escaped into the beneath. The mouths you summon gasp the lungs bound to them burn with ever sharper starbursts of suffocation. Every second is a new death, your existence, relentless agony. You steal as much strength from those beneath you as your agony-addled will allows. You howl and howl. Whatever your mother's ulterior motives might have been, this much you know is true. You were thinking about something other than your surroundings when she came into your room. And that is everything I plan to read. So. <laughs> Thank you. Silly me, two books. <laughs> Thank you for letting me read from both of them. That was great. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. So, um, we're gonna take a five minute break. Yeah, we're gonna so, take a five great. minute break so everyone can get a drink, uh, use the restroom if they need to. We'll be back, uh, in just a couple minutes with uh, Benjamin Rosenbaum. So, stick around. Yeah, Ben. And I'm gonna get fancy with these banners. Let's see. Ah, there we go. All nice. right. Nice.
Hey, I'm back. I'm going to unmute. Okay. My doorbell just rang, but I'm not going to get it. <laughs> well, Mike's not back. You don't want to wait for Probably Mike. Probably a package. I don't know who it is. No, you don't want to wait for Mike? I do, but uh, I don't know if I can. All right, I'm going to wait for Mike. I'll just, I still have him muted, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get the door, but we'll, we'll wait for Mike. So how is everyone? How was your break? <laughs> I had to run to use it wisely. Yes. <laughs> well, here he is. All right. Um, yeah, I saw some questions flying by in the comments, but uh, pl please save your questions for uh, for after the reading, um, because we're gonna we're gonna get started with Ben Rosenbaum in a second. So let me just do this. There we go. Ben, you ready? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so yeah, as Ellen said, uh, this is fantastic fiction at KGB. We're no longer at the bar because of the uh, quarantine in, in New York City. Uh, but um, the uh, the KGB bar um, still could use your help. Uh, you know, all bars are closed in New York. You can't go to any of them. Um, we really. Um, we love the bar not just because they host us, but because they're uh, a great venue for um, fiction and poetry and art in, in New York City. Uh, New York Times called them uh, one of the best literary venues in the city. Um, you know, every, almost every day of the week, they have some kind of reading, poetry reading, um, uh, you know, event. Uh, so uh, we, we want to keep them going. Um, let me see, I have a... Um, a link here. Let me see if I can put it up here. Where is it? Where is it? Where do you go? Here you go. Okay, so they have a um, a GoFundMe page that uh, you could go there if you go to that link, uh, and it's also in the description uh, of the YouTube video. Uh, you can go there and just give a little bit of money to the bar, and uh, the owner Dennis Wojcik promises to give a percentage of uh, every dollar donated to the bartenders. Um, our bartenders for the fantastic fiction reading readings are Dan and Seiji, who are uh, awesome bartenders, our favorite. Uh, we love them and we miss them dearly. So if, if they're watching, hello, we miss you guys. We can't wait to see you guys again and uh, do after the reading shots of vodka at the bar. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, it's it's um, it's. It's been difficult to not see people face to face, but I think it's things like this that make it make it worth it for me. And others have said the same thing. It's just like it's a nice, you know, we, like we were talking before. We didn't have ReaderCon this year. I love ReaderCon. We would have gone to ReaderCon this past weekend, uh, but it's nice to see, you know, Mike and Ben and others and people online. So uh, yeah, if we can't do it in person, maybe we can do a little bit uh, virtually. But um, yeah, so. Um, all right, our next reader is Benjamin Rosenbaum. Ben is joining us all the way from Switzerland. So thank you for staying up late, Ben. <laughs> so if I'm a little groggy, that's why. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Benjamin Rosenbaum's short fiction has been nominated for a Nebula, Hugo, BSFA, Sturgeon, Locust, and World Fantasy Awards and collected in The Ant King and Other Stories. His first novel, The Unraveling, a far future comedy of manners and social unrest, comes, a, comes out this October from Erewhon Books. His tabletop role-playing game of Jewish historical fantasy in the shtetl, Dream Apart, was nominated for an Ennie Award. He lives near Basel, Switzerland with his family. Here's Ben Rosenbaum. Hey. All right, as I said, it's two in the morning, so forgive me if I'm a little groggy. I'm going to read from my novel, The Unraveling, which takes place half a million years in the future. Um, I'm going to read, I'm going to start with the first chapter where the protagonist is five years old. And uh, depending on time, uh, I may skip ahead to chapter three, which is uh, set 10 years later. The Unraveling. Fifth was almost five. And he wasn't like Zer anymore to be asleep in all of Zer bodies. Z wasn't a baby anymore. Z was old enough for school. 
old enough to walk all alone across the habitation, down the spoke to the great and buzzing center of Fu. But Z had been wound up with excitement for days, practically dancing around the house. Father Missisk had laughed. Father Smistria had shooed Zer out of the supper garden. Father Frill had taken Zer to the bathing room to swim back and forth, back and forth, to calm you down. And just before supper, Zed finally collapsed, twice, in the atrium and curled up on the tiered balcony. Father Arevio and Father Squell had carried Zer in those two bodies back to Zer's room. Zed managed to stay awake in their third body through most of supper, blinking hugely and breathing in through their nose and trying to sit up straight as waves of deep blue slumber from Zer to sleeping brains washed through Zer. By supper's end, Z couldn't stand up, and Father Squell carried that body, too, to bed. Muddy dreams of sitting on a wooden floor in a long hall, of Zer name being called, of realizing he hadn't worn Zer gowns after all, but was somehow humiliatingly dressed in Father Frill's golden bells instead, the other children laughing at Zer and dizziness, and suddenly, surreally, the hall being full of flutterbys, their translucent wings fluttering, their projection surfaces glittering. Then someone was stroking Fifth's eyebrow, gently, and he tried to nestle further down into the blankets, and the someone started gently pulling on Zer's earlobe. Z opens her eyes, and it was Father Squell. Good morning, little couple hedge, V said. You have a big day today. Father Squell was slim and rosy-skinned and smelled like soap and flowers. Fifth crawled into Squell's lap and flung their arms around them and pressed their nose between her bosoms. V was dressed in glittery red fabric, soft and slippery under Fifth's fingers. Squell was bald with coppery metal spikes extruding from the skin of her scalp. Sometimes Father Frill teased about the spikes, which weren't fashionable anymore. And sometimes then Father Squell stormed out of the room because V was a little vain. Father Squell was never much of a fighter, the other fathers said, but he had a body in the asteroids and that was something amazing. Squell reached over Fifth still in her lap and started stroking the eyebrow of another of Fifth's bodies. Fifth sneezed in that body and then sneezed in the other two. And that was funny and Z started to giggle. Now Z was all awake. Up, little cobble hedge, Squell said, up. Fifth crawled out of bed, careful not to crawl over as herself. It always made Zer a little restless to be all together, all three bodies in the same room. That wasn't really good. It was because Zer's somatic integration wasn't totally successful which is why he kept having to see pedagogical expert Pim Moralazic Foundelli of Name Registry Pneumatic Lance 12. Pedagogical expert Pim Moralazic Foundelli had put an awful nag agent in Fifth's mind to tell Zer to look herself in the eye and play in a coordinated manner and do the exercises. It was nagging now, but Fifth ignored it as he looked under the bed for Zer gowns. They weren't there. Fifth closed their eyes, because he wasn't so good yet at using the feed with them open, and looked all over the house. The gowns weren't in the balcony, or the atrium, or the small mat room, or the breakfast room. Fathers Arevio and Smistria and Frill, and another of Father Squell's bodies, were in the breakfast room, already eating. Father Missisk was arguing with the kitchen. Where are my gowns? Fifth asked their agents but maybe did it wrong somehow because the agents didn't say anything. Father Squell, she said, opening her eyes, I can't find my gowns and my agents can't either. I composted your gowns. They were old, Squell said. Go down to the bathing room and get washed. I'll make you some new clothes. Fifth hearts began to pound. The gowns weren't old. They only came out of the oven a week ago. But I want those gowns, she said. Squell opened the door. You can't have those gowns. Those gowns are compost. Bathing. Be snatched, fifth up. One of their bodies under her arm, the wrist of another caught in her other hand. Fifth was up in the air and wriggled and was held by the arm and pulled and 
was on hands and knees by the bed and looked desperately under it for their gowns. They weren't old, Z said, their voice wavering. Fifth, Squell said, exasperated. That's enough. For Kumru's sake, today of all days. V dragged Fifth, or as much as Fifth as V'd managed to get a hold of, out the door. In another body, this one with silvery spikes on its head, V came hurrying down the hall. I want them back, Fifth said. Z wouldn't cry. Z wasn't a baby anymore, but a big stage child. And stage don't cry. Z wouldn't cry. Z wouldn't even shout or emphasize. Z would stay calm and clear. Today of all days. Z was still struggling a little. And Squell handed Zerdevere other body. They are compost, Squell said, reddening, in the body with the silver spikes, while the one with the copper spikes came into the room. They have gone down the sluice and dissolved. Your gowns are now part of the nutrient flow, and they could be anywhere in full belly, and they will probably be part of your breakfast next week. Fifth gasped. Z didn't want to eat their gowns. There was a cold lump in their stomach. Squell caught their third body. Father Missisk came down the corridor, double-bodied. He was bigger than Squell, broad-chested, square-jawed, with a mane of blood-red hair and sunset-orange skin, traced all over with white squiggles. Missisk was wearing dancing pants. Her voice was deep and rumbly, and V V smelled warm, roasty, and oily. Fifth, little fifth, V said, come on, let's zoom around. I'll zoom you to the bathing room. Come jump up. Gives her here, Squell. I want my gowns, Fifth said, in their third body, as Squell drags her through the doorway. Here, Squell said, trying to hand Fifth's other bodies to Missisk. But Fifth clung to Squell. Z didn't want to zoom right now. Zooming was fun, but too wild for this day, and too wild for someone who had lost their gowns. The gowns were a pale blue, soft as clouds. It would whisper around Fifth's legs when she ran. Oh, fifth, please, Squell said. You must bathe, and you will not be late today. Today of all... Is Z really ready for this, do you think? Mrs. said, trying to pry fifth away from Squell, but flinching back from prying hard enough. Oh, please, Misk, Squell said. Let us not start that, or not with me. Pip says... Father Smistria stuck their head out of the door of the studio. Why are you two winding the child up? He barked. He was tall and haggard looking and had brilliant blue skin and a white beard braided into hundreds of tiny braids woven with little glittering mirrors and jewels and was wearing a slick swirling combat suit that clung to her skinny flat chest. Her voice was higher than Father Missisk's, squeaky and gravelly at the same time. This is going to be a disaster if you, keep, if you give Zir the impression that this is a day for racing about. Fift, you'll stop this now. Come on, Fift, Misk said coaxingly. Put Zir down, Smistry said. I cannot believe you are wrestling and flying about with a stage child who in less than three hours... Oh, give it a rest, me, Missus said, sort of threatening, and turned away from Fifth and Squell towards Smistria. Smistria stepped fully out into the corridor, putting her face next to Missus's. It got like thunder in between them, but Fifth knew they wouldn't hit each other. Grown-up veils only hit each other on the mats. Still, Z hugged Squell closer, one body squished against her soft chest, one body hugging a leg, one body pulling back through the doorway, and squeezed all their eyes shut, and dimmed the house feed, so he couldn't see that way either. Behind their eyes, Fifth could only see the pale blue gowns. It's just like in their dream. So he'd lost their gowns, and would have to go wearing bells like Father Frill, as he shuddered. I don't want my gowns to be in the compost, Z said, as reasonably as he could manage. Oh, will you shut up about the gowns, Squell said. No one cares about your gowns. That's not true, Miss Isk boomed, shocked. It is true, Smistry said, and Fifth could feel a sob ballooning inside. He tried to hold it in, but it grew and grew and... Beloveds, said Father Grobert. Fifth opened their eyes. Father Grobert had come silently, single-bodied up the corridor to stand behind Squell. He was shorter than Missisk and Smistria, the same height as Squell, but more solid, broad and flat, like a stone. When Father Grobert stood still, it looked like Z would never move again. Zir's shift was plain and simple and white, 
Their skin was a mottled creamy brown, with the same fine golden fuzz of hair everywhere, even the top of their head. Grobby, Squell said, we are trying to get there ready, but it's quite... Well, it's Grobbert's show, Smithery said. It's up to you and Pip today, Grobbert, isn't it? Why don't you get there ready? Grobbert held out their hand. Fifth swallowed, and then he slid down from Squell's arms and went and took it. Grobbert, Mrs. said, are you sure Fifth is ready for this? Is it really? Yes, Grobbert said. Then he looked at Mrs. their face as calm as ever. He raised one eyebrow, just a little. Then he looked back at Fifth's other bodies and held out their other hand. Squell let go, and Fifth gathered, holding one of Father Grobbert's hands on one side and one on the other, and catching hold of the back of Father Grobbert's shift. And that way, they went down to the bathing room. My gowns weren't old, Fifth said on the stairs. They came out of the oven a week ago. No, they weren't old, Robert said, but they were blue. Blue as a veil color, the color of the crashing, restless sea. You were a staid, and today you will enter the first gate of logic. You couldn't do that wearing blue gowns. Oh, Fifth said. Robert sat by the side of the bathing pool, their hands in their lap, their legs in the water, while Fifth scrubs herself soapy. Father Grobert, Fifth said, why are you a father? What do you mean? Father Grobert asked. I am your father, Fifth. You are my child. But why aren't you a mother? Mother Pip is a mother, and Z's, um, you're... Grobert's forehead wrinkled briefly, and then it smoothed, and their lips quirked in a tiny suggestion of a smile. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Because you have only one staid father, and the rest are veils, you think that being a father is a veilish thing to be. You think fathers should be V's and mothers should be Z's. Fifth frowned and stopped mid-scrub. What about your friends? All, 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 all of your friends' mothers stayed? Are they all Z or are some of them V? Grobert paused a moment and then gently, what about your friend Umlish Menemu of Manathis cohort? Isn't your mother a veil? Oh, Fifth said and frowned again. Well, what makes someone a mother? Your mother carried you in their womb, Fifth. You grew inside their belly. You were born out of their vagina into the world. Some families don't have children that way, so in some families all the parents are fathers. But we are quite traditional. Indeed, we are all Kumruists except for Father Thurm. And Kumruists believe that biological birth is sacred, so you have a mother. Fifth knew that, though it still seemed strange. So he'd been inside Mother Pip for ten months, single-bodied because their other two bodies hadn't been fashioned yet. That was an eerie thought. Tiny, helpless, one-bodied, unbreathing, their nut-sized heart drawing nutrients from Pip's blood. Why did Pip get to be my mother? Now Grobert was clearly smiling. Have you ever tried to refuse your mother Pip anything? Fifth shook, shook their head solemnly. It doesn't work, because he's always the younger sibling. That meant the one who won the argument. But it also meant the littlest child, if there were more than one in a family. Fifth wasn't sure why it meant both those things. Grobert chuckled. Yes, there was a little bit of debate, but I think we all knew Pip would prevail. He had a uterus and vagina enabled and made sure we all had penises for the impregnation. It was an exciting time. Fifth pulled up the feed and looked up penises. They were for squirting sperm, which helped decide what the baby would be like. The egg could sort through all the sperm and pick the genes it wanted, but you had to publish something or other to get approval, and after that, it was too complicated. You'd have one on each body, dangling between your legs. Do you still have penises? One on each body? Yes, I kept mine, Robert said. They went well with the rest of me, and I don't like too many changes. Can I have penises? Z said. I suppose, if you like, Robert said, but not today. Today you have something more important to do. And now that I see that your father has baked you new clothes, so rinse off and let's go upstairs. Uh, so I'm going to uh, skip to the third chapter. <laughs> um, fifth was 15. And Father Orevio was showing Zir how to score the vines in the supper garden cutting long, shallow gashes along each to let the spice gnats feed on the sap. 
in another body as he sat next to mother pip looking through the porthole of a robot bat wheeling through the space between the habitations behind them the rotating spoke wheel of foo home to fifth and a million others fell away they were on their way to see a client fifth forced herself not to fidget in their seat mother pip should have had a more worthy apprentice a 15 year old only child with no real triumphs to see her name fifth should have been working for one of the one-stop shop banker, historian, bookie, clown, logician booths at a walk-around market or doing menial work of the most peripheral kind at some big institutional memory conglomerate. But Pip, who was the third of four siblings, bulldozed through such considerations. As their clients admired their habit of flaunting conventions, their eccentricities worked to their advantage. Whether Fifth could afford them that was another question. The wrongness of their position clung to her like an itch. Mother Pip sent, you have not adequately studied Palm Politicus's career. I studied the weave you gave me, Fifth sent. It had been slow going. Palm Politicus, proprietor of Stiff Waddle Somatic Fashions, the most prestigious body design emporium in a billion cubic body lengths, had been Mother Pip's client for 200 years. Fifth, I can see perfectly well from the access trail which strands of the weave you haphazardly blundered along. A banker historian must know their client intimately, more intimately than the client knows their self. To study, to absorb the life, the career, the public emotional history of the client is the merest preliminary. Fifth, pressed their nose against the porthole as far as he could get from their mother in the cramped space. They were almost there. Stiff Waddle Somatic Fashions occupied the second of a cascade of angular, translucent baubles arranged in a glittering helical chain, hanging luxuriously in a great swath of empty space in what residents of Fu called the below and behind. Z pulled the weave back up and fumbled through it again. Palm's Emporium was large enough for hundreds of bodies to be serviced, remodeled, and remapped simultaneously by their elite staff of two dozen. It was a middle grade establishment in the wider scheme of things, but for 10 million people in the immediately surrounding cubic volume, it was a marvel. Stylish and confident younger siblings from Foo would save up a year's worth of daring for a chance to impress their friends with some minor bodily enhancement from Stiff Waddle. Certain of Full Belly's ultra rich, virtuoso logistics coordinators, major attention brokers, celebrity statistician poets drop by weekly. A low-level pattern recognition agent called their attention to the apprentices at the bottom of the staff list, and there V was Shreya Qualia Fnax of Name Registry Digger Chameleon 2, genital design specialist. Shreya. Fifth's heart gave a pulse. It had been months, maybe a year since he'd seen Vim. There'd been a time years ago when they'd seen each other every week in class or meeting somewhere around Foo. Sometimes V'd come over to the Araxis cohort's apartment. A few times Fifth had gone over to Fnax cohorts. Fifth's parents liked Vim. In class, the 10-year-old Shreya had been guarded and sullen, but in the supper garden with Frill and Squell and Arevio, sheltered from the broad world's feet by Araxis cohort's privacy regime, V'd been self-confident, alert, funny. The last few years, it had gotten harder. There were fewer things Vales and stage their age could do together. Less of their homework overlapped as their curricula diverged. Fifth was meant spending more time on the long conversation, and that wasn't something Z could talk to Shreya about. And Shri was doing veil things. They had a gang of veils now who sparred together and swaggered around the byways trying to find quarrels legitimate enough to justify a real fight on the mats. And there were other things, sexual escapades, that Fifth wasn't supposed to know about. Even if Shri had wanted to tell her, it wasn't like there was anywhere if he could. Their parents could still read their send logs and hear them over the house feed. The career of the client, Fifth, Pip sent, not of the client's youngest apprentice, no matter how impressive their debut. Get out of my head, Fifth thought, but didn't send. Hurriedly, Z flipped away from the staff list to browse the annual growth of Stiff Waddle Somatic Fashion's audience and ratings. There was an ache in their chest when she thought of Shreya. 
I think I might as well stop there. <laughs> that was good. Uh, they're, they're still muted. They're still, the mic's gone, but muted. There you go. Yeah. No, I'm just unmuting the wrong one. There we go. Wait. Oh, no. Mike's, mic's unmuted. Uh, Mike, I can't unmute you. Maybe you can unmute yourself. No. Oh, oh well, there it yes. is. There it goes. I think we got it. We got it. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. That's great. I enjoyed that that reading very much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I loved it. Someone has, <laughs> has a question already. If you want to ask it, Stacy. Go ahead, Stacy's mom. Go for it. If you have a question. Stacy's mom's had bunches of questions. Yes, I, I didn't get to one of the earlier questions, which was, what do you think of a Romany version of Dream Apart, which is that that's a great idea. Um, Dream Apart is the is the role play, tabletop role playing game that's oh. set in the shtetl oh. that I that I wrote. And there's actually we had a, as as Kickstarter stretch goals, we had a bunch of people um, write some additional content for it, including Ellen Kushner and or a couple of rabbis I know, um, at least one. And um, also somebody who's Roma wrote a, uh, a Romany um, sort of just one pager. But, uh, but I think a whole Romany belonging outside belonging game would be awesome. Right. Linda is the answer to that question. Linda has a question for Benjamin. Were you using pronouns like Z and Zir? Yes. Well, there's two uh, genders. Uh, the stayed, which is the pronouns are Z, Zir, and how do you pronounce um, that? S-T-A-I-D or what? Stayed, yeah, S-T-A-I-D. And Vail, which is V-A-I-L, which the pronouns are V, Ver, Vem. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really interesting, like, uh, we, Liz and I went back and forth a lot. Um, there have been many revisions to how to approach the pronouns. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, it's actually, the book was initially published in German before it came out in English, and there, it didn't use neo pronouns. It used air and z. But I, um, I, I worked up my courage at, with at Liz Kransky's, um, uh support and encouragement to use neo pronouns. And I actually think it's it's uh, they are actually different genders. They're not male and female. So they. Um, what are neo pronouns? I'm sorry. Well, um, new newer pronouns. It's I mean, not invented pronouns. But they are real pronouns. Z and, pronouns. Both Z and Z are pronouns that, that people actually use in, in the real world. And um, I guess one of my concerns about using them was whether I was appropriating somebody else's pronouns. But the few people who we talked to who, who uh, had that experience seemed to be like fine with the idea. And, um, and I was reassured on that score when I considered that maybe the pronouns had actually survived. So I was making an extrapolation and not and not just grabbing them. Okay. I have a question for Mike here. Liz points out that all pronouns are made up, which is actually 100% oh, yeah. true. Sorry, Mike, um, <laughs> the third collection of short stories, how does it fit with what you've done before? What's that? This uh, is for Mike. This uh, is, yeah, I didn't hear it. It's your third collection of stories. <clears throat> um, how does it fit in with what's come before this collection? Oh. Well, um, so so I don't, I guess I principally write horror, but I write a bunch of other things too. I write sort of, I write sort of really out there uh, science fiction and, and, and fantasy. And uh, if anybody is familiar with, with the Clockwork Phoenix anthologies that I edited, they probably sure, wouldn't yeah. be very surprised mm. by that. Uh, because that was kind of what what the focus of those anthologies was, and aftermath of an in industrial accident, um, it it's I thought of it as like as like the follow up to my collection on unseeming, which was probably about as much of a pure horror volume as I'm going to produce. But aftermath brings in a lot of other things too, like there's there's fantasy in there. There's 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 science fiction in there. All of it is dark, in some way, because that's the way that my mind works. Uh, so I still feel like it's it's okay for me to try to market it 
as 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 a, as a volume of horror stories, but it's a lot wilder mm -hmm. in terms of what's in it, and it's a lot more representative of what I write. There's there's even some there's even some poetry in there. You know, there used to be a time when that was pretty much all I was known for. I don't really write poetry now, but there's still some of it in that book. So you know, it's I guess the most representative book of what I write that I've done so far. Okay. Yeah, and if you haven't checked out the clock, thank you for the question. Stuff, that's uh, they, those are uh, great. Um, I have a question for. Thank can you. I ask one for Ben, or you want to go, Ellen? <laughs> Uh, this one's for Ben. Um, tell me about the, the transition from uh, short stories to novels. What was that like for you? Um, that, it, I, it, well, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is my first novel, and I, I so I don't know, after, you know, many, many years of writing short stories, um, uh, and I think they were surprisingly different. I mean, obviously, some things are transferable on the line level, but the process was totally different, and I, I had, a, I struggled a lot with uh, you know, going from a sprint to a marathon, you know, I, I sort of feel like you could sort of throw yourself at a short story and like, you know, kind of have enough of an idea that you sort of barrel your way through and, uh, and trying to do that with novels. First of all, th that's one thing is that just the stamina, like it was, it's just the way I wrote story stories was unsustainable to try and write a novel that, that, uh, that, you know, you run out of steam and you have to have some kind of architecture to make your way through, even though I'm not really a planner, but like, there's no way to, to this like, and, and also just being fixated on the goal of completion is like counterproductive. I sort of felt like I had to do, write a novel, uh, not by looking at the finish line and heading towards it, but sort of like by just having the pace every day of like, I did this many words, you know, um, like enduring until someday, for, in, in, someday at some point you emerge into the, uh, into the finish line, but like, you can't, you, you almost can't predict when. That was my experience. I'm very slow. But, um, and the other thing is that short stories have this gem-like perfection sometimes where like every piece relates to some every other piece. And if you try to do that in a novel, not only is it impossible because it breaks your brain, but it's also, it's also not, a, not good because it can't breathe. Like novels sort of need to be messier and have like loose ends and, you know, roughness because that kind of like intricacy at that scale just is uh, claustrophobic. Right. I was actually when you write when you wrote the novel, did you have the whole thing planned out, or did you? I mean, I, no. I you're, you're a pantser. <laughs> you're a pantser. Yeah, I'm very much a pantser, and the novel was like, but you know, and I, I, and I, I had to keep making plans because there was just no way to get through it otherwise. But then I keep breaking them. So like, I, I mean, at one point I threw away forty thousand words. I, I, you know, I, I. I just, the, the novel was a series of like crashing and burning and like, you know, resurrecting from the ashes. So it's, you know, there were drafts were dramatically different one from the other. I hope next time I write a novel that I will have learned something and it will be less arduous. <laughs> you haven't written a novel yet, have you? A published novel? Mike? Mike, are you there? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm having a little trouble hearing you for some reason. Have you published a novel? You haven't, you've done a novella. Have you published a novel? I have. I have one. I have one novel that that came out in like that that, that came out in like 2013, and most people missed it. What was uh, it? It was called the Black. It was called the Blackfire Concerto. Okay. It was like an apocalyptic, dark fantasy zombie novel. Okay. Uh, and it was act It was published by uh, a small press called Haunted Stars, which actually was Black Gate. Mm. Oh. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, and and uh, John O'Neill at the time had these grand plans for launching this this imprint that was going to have a whole lot of sword and sorcery and and dark fantasy, and somehow my novel was the only one that actually made it into print, <laughs> and and nothing else worked out, and and uh, so so I so I I have had a novel come out, but you know very few have read it. I do still sure. occasionally have. Uh, I'm afraid I never heard of uh, it. I'm sorry. I missed it. Um, I it. Well, I tried to make everybody aware of it as I could, but you know, I I don't have. I don't know what whatever whatever 
uh, I mean, there's there's just this avalanche of stuff coming at all coming at people all the time, and I don't have like the massive social media presence that some people out there have. Uh, there are people who who read it and love it and and come to me asking about when the sequel's coming out, and I always feel sort of terrible for them <laughs> <laughs> when when that happens. Uh, even though I did write a rough draft of it, but. Uh, you know, I'm I'm trying with other novels, but nothing else has been published yet. Mike, I got a question for you. So um, obviously, um, the the pandemic and and uh, the recent um, Black Lives Matters protests and police protests against police brutality. So I know you have a micro press, right? So can you I tell do. me a little bit about <laughs> about what's what that's like running a, a press in, in, in these times? Well, I mean, my problems are the smallest problems in the world compared to, you know, what is going on with the pandemic and, and you know, with, with, you know, the, with, with, with all the issues that have, that have been brought up repeatedly, but brought up extremely, you know, intensely and necessarily in the past couple of months, you know, through Black Lives Matter and, and similar civil rights efforts. But, uh, you know, the, my tiny problem is, as someone running a, a micropress, that you know, it's it's not, you know, when it was when it was really just the pandemic, it was possible for me to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm I'm coming up with things maybe for you to pass the time, uh, you know, while while you're stuck at home, uh, while 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 you're while you're stuck at home, while you're looking for things to do, here are some things that you can do. Uh, you know, here's some stuff you can read. Here's, you know, I discounted a lot of my books and that actually worked, you know, very well for a while. Uh, with the rise of the protests, you know, my thoughts were, well, you know, I can't compete with that and I shouldn't even try. You know, that that's, you know, the the best I can do is kind of express my own support and then, you know, try to still be there when, you know, try to still be there when, when, people have more interest in the sort of thing that I'm offering through mythic delirium books. Um, but, you know, I assume, uh, I'm, this is a strange thing to say, but I feel lucky in a way in that I am too small to fail. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I'm very careful with my expenses and I, and I like, I don't have, I don't have my livelihood riding on whether a particular book, you know, makes it or, or doesn't make it, but just based on just based on what I've been experiencing, I have to imagine things are, are very frightening for for larger publishers at the moment. Sure. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry for both of you actually, but this is related to that. But ben, have you had a have you been able to write during this whole time, or has it kind oh, of man. kind of stifled your creativity? What do you think? For me. Yeah. Then you want that? Um, initially, when the pandemic started, it kind of blew up my productivity entirely. Not just um, writing, like my day job. I don't know, cooking. Like I, I you know, I, I became very non-functional for a little bit, um, partly because of stress, but a lot of it just because the structures eroded, and I realized how dependent I am on physical spaces to like tell my brain what I'm supposed to be doing now. Like I bike to work and then I sit in my office and then I go to a cafe and write. And then I, you know what I mean? Like this does. And so just trying to do everything in a corner of my bedroom on a computer on zoom all day was just catastrophic for productivity. But I actually was able to reasonably after a few weeks kind of restructure things and, um, my uh my I, I, I it turned out that the picnic table in the backyard was in the, in the little little enclosed courtyard behind our house we live in like a three three apartments in one building there's a little picnic table in the courtyard that was far enough away from my other desk that i could write there so i started going out there and write there and my daughter and sometimes my son would come out and hang out with me and do stuff on their computer so i i uh, i i ended up um, with a little 
like a, just a little sacred space. And like, so sometimes we would put up like the sun umbrella and it'd be raining and I'd be hunched over on this little computer and a picnic table in the backyard. But like, I don't know, it's just enough physical distance that I was able to, so then it got better. But uh, it <laughs> was. About writing. That's yeah, how it yeah, I, I had a similar experience, you know, in my day job, I'm a newspaper reporter and uh, they're through a budget decision. Yeah. It's, yeah. There actually are still newspaper reporters left, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, my, through a budgeting decision at my day job, my job got changed from covering one beat, the arts uh, to also covering the, uh, to also covering the governments of two neighboring counties where mm -hmm. I live here in Southwest Virginia. And uh, when, uh, when things really, you know, when, 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 when things really became intense with the, the pandemic and, and the shutdowns that resulted from that, uh, that, that essentially made, made my job you know, just kind of go bonkers because because everything in all three of my beats was being affected very drastically uh, by the pandemic, and I had to cover all of it. So, uh, so I'm working from home, but I'm putting in more hours week to week to week than I than like I have in years. Uh, and so, you know, that made doing other stuff much harder. And of course, you know, as I mentioned earlier, silly me, I produced two books <laughs> during this era. Uh, and, and so what, what itty bitty time I had left, I was sort of scrambling to do that. Uh, I did manage actually a couple weeks ago, uh, to, to write and to write a new short story and submit it. Uh, a couple friends of mine, uh, Amanda McGee, who has her debut novella in a sinister quartet and, uh, Rich Larson, a young, very talented short story writer who, you know, Ellen, I know, you know him. Canadian uh, and have worked with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that rich. You know, he gave me gave me some. And then it's like five minutes later, he wants to send me another one. I said, I can't. You ready? <laughs> he is amazing. He's amazing, and he gave me feed. They gave me feedback on this, and I managed to get it out there. And now I'm now I'm waiting for word, and, and I haven't been in that position in a while, so that's pretty cool. And I have another story I'm working on now. So, but it's like. It's like something I've just barely managed to get started again. And I have a new novel that I finished the first draft of back in January that I'm hoping to find the energy and time to revise. Uh, you know, I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I'm working on it. Um, also, I just want to remind uh, people who are watching live that if you comment, um, we, you know, if you want to ask the authors a question, please do. We, we would be, uh, be happy to have your questions. There's a there's a yes, backlog please. of like twelve questions from Stacy's mom. So I, I I could I could if you want mostly directed at me. I I will I will rapid fire answer them if you want. Sure. Okay. Well, I, um, I I have one for I have one for Stacy's mom too. That mentioned loving the plushies on on my shelves behind me. There's like five Cthulhu's mixed in there somewhere. <laughs> nice. I feel the need to highlight that. Do <laughs> you have any zero gravity indicators? Did, did any of you I, watch I the SpaceX launch where they uh, they had like a um, hologram plushie that, and they were like, oh, it's our zero gravity indicator. And oh, like, that'd be cool. No, I don't have one. Nice. That was really silly. Um, Stacy's mom asks this. For all of you, what's your advice for writing a story? I think that's pretty generic, but uh, maybe we can... Uh, I don't know. Give one piece of advice that that uh, might help someone write a story. I don't know. I so they don't write stories. I can barely write introductions. So I hate. <laughs> yeah. I have lots of advice. <laughs> I hate writing introductions. How do, I write how do I narrow it down? Someone told me when I had a problem. When I have a problem, someone says just write anything down. Just put what your idea is for like a you know just throw it on the page. And see what happens, and that's a little helpful. And I don't know if that's helpful for fiction writers at all. <laughs> you know? um, I think that uh, the main advice is that there's a zillion ways to do it. Like, and so be suspicious of everyone's right. advice because it's custom made for them. And right. so, like, there's lots of and and like I would say whatever. Uh, so one thing is that people often think they need like 
in the beginning when you write, you think I will I will need to have ideas that will be hard. It, actually, you have constantly ideas, but you've learned to censor them. You know what I mean? Like when you're when you're five, you have like a million ideas. You're like, there's like a Godzilla and he has an ax. And then, you know, there's jelly beans. Like, you know what I mean? You're like a, fa a fountain of creativity. And then like, you know, formal schooling and the world like squashes that, but it's still there. So if you actually just like start listening to yourself in the shower and when you're biking and like, you know, have a notebook around, you will, uh, it will, the worst time to have an idea is when you sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and are like, now I will write a story, then you definitely don't have yeah. an idea. But the rest of the time, there's always crap happening in your head if you tune into it. Um, and, uh, and so probably, and the other thing is that it, pro you know, like you can write, if you want to have one, if it's really hard to have one good idea and it's easy to have like 20 mostly terrible ideas. If you decide you're gonna have 20 terrible ideas, one of them will be good. And so just throwing lots of things down helps. And you can all, like everybody gets better in revision. Like the first time you put it down, it's often terrible, but that's okay because nobody, I mean, you know, they're, well, they're, they're legendary people who supposedly just publish their first drafts all the time. But like, you know, the, the it, it don't assume that because your idea sounds stupid on the first draft that it won't be great on the like eighth draft. I like I like that idea of just um, that you're always you always have ideas, but you 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 self censor and and I think that uh, there's been times for me where like when I was work you know recently working on a novel and then I was like oh I want to fix this and I want to fix this and I and I decided to write down every little idea and it's kind of crazy once you start doing that they just come all the time and I had like ridiculous number of them and there were all these like post it notes and things and then I had to like mm -hmm. recollect them and stuff. Any any uh, any writing advice, Mike? Well, I mean, Ben Ben covered a lot of it. Uh, I mean, my my basic advice would 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 come down to you know if you start a story, finish it. But if you get stuck, stop and start something else. You know, finishing is finishing the story is like the biggest part of the whole battle, and you can always go back and fix it up and make it better later. But uh, you know finishing is the first thing read a lot uh you know it's you it, there's i mean you know, what's important about your story is that you're telling it your way but you know you 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 can't really do it in a vacuum you you need outside information to come in and help you come up with the ideas that you're going to need uh and my my personal favorite piece of writing advice that basically applies to everything, not just not just stories, is something that I first saw on I think Elizabeth Bear's Live Journal many many years ago. If anyone remembers Live Journal, sure. uh, <laughs> where she talked she talked about the three sentences rule, which basically if if you can't find time to write or if you're too tired to write, which is certainly something I deal with all the time. You can probably at very least add three sentences to a work in progress and try to do that, you know, as often as you can. If you can't do it every day, just do it when you can. And sometimes those three sentences will be all you write and sometimes something will catch and you'll end up writing a lot more. But, you know, the repetitive act of, of making this, you know, a habit is, is what's most important over anything else. Yeah, Stephen um, King talks I, about that in on writing. He said he talks about it like as a faucet, and and I, you know, for me, for me, it's like writing at the same time every day uh, helps, like right. my will automatically kick in at that time. So, like, you know, before the pandemic, you know, sometimes I would have to go in to visit a client or something, and I'd be on the subway when I'd normally be writing, and suddenly my brain is filling with all these mm -hmm. ideas. Like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, this is my writing hour. This is when mm -hmm. I. I Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think so much of it is process and habit and just like what, what making it predictable that it will happen, you know, arranging things so that it's predictable that like, as opposed to trying to have willpower and be like, I'm going to do the thing. It's actually, you know, if you, if you know yourself well enough to know, like, well, like I am so distractible that I would actually, I actually made a another account on my computer. That's like locked down with child 
uh, you know, the child protection controls so that it can't do anything but write on it. And then I hide my password from the other account and then I leave my house. So that like, even if I'm really tempted to do something else, I, I literally, it would be extremely embarrassing. I'd have to like pay for my coffee and bike home in order to get my password. Like, you know, setting up enough of a barrier to distraction that oh, it actually great. is the path I, of least resistance to write. Jeff, Jeff um, Vandermeer once said that he asked his wife Anne to like hide the Wi-Fi router every day. So every day she would leave the house, she would unplug the Wi-Fi router, put it somewhere. And he's like, I could search the house. I know it's in the house. Yeah. But you know, in the time it would take me to find it, I could just do my writing. Right. Um, yeah. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. What I always say is never throw anything away. If, if something's not working, if you fin can't finish a story, or if the story sucks, cannibalize, cannibalize, cannibalize. Mm. Yeah, put right. it in the drawer and look at it in three or six months, and suddenly with fresh eyes, it's a different story. Yeah, or you mm -hmm. piece of that if you do something else with it. Yeah, yeah there's also right. really there's interesting. The, 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 the thing occurs to you that makes it a story, come, you know, pops, pops mm -hmm. up later, sometimes years later. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, often you need. You, you, multiple disparate ideas that you had at different times to, to put together. And there's a, there's a funny, there's a phenomenon I always find fascinating, which is like, um, and I have a neurological theory about, which is why you feel like when you finish writing something, it's amazing. So what, sometimes you have a day where you write something and you're like, this was, I mean, sometimes it's just all suffering, but sometimes you're like, this is great. And then you go back the next day and you look at it and it's crap. It's terrible. You're like, who wrote this? And then like a week or two later, you read it and you're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's, that, that could work. You know what I mean? Like you get some distance from it. And I, I think that the, what I think is going on is that what you're doing is you're building on these structures in your brain, which is actually the story. And then you write down all the little marks on the paper or the screen that are supposed to represent the story. And when the structures are fresh in your brain, then you look at the marks and you're like, that's the thing. But then like the, the, the structures gradually decay over time so that 24 hours later, when you look at it, it's painful because there's enough of the structures in your brain that are still there kind of, but they're like falling apart. And so the the marks on the paper, like sort of, re but the, the the gap between what you imagined and what's actually on the page is so acutely painful. And then, like two weeks later, you have no idea what you originally intended, so you're just reading what's actually there and making new ones. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So that's I've done my that. Experience. Yeah. That's a great yeah, explanation also, for it. Also, like, you know, there are some days when you just you're at the keyboard and you're tired, and you, you know, you, you know, like you're not at your best, and you're just like, all right, I'm I'm putting in my words and I'm just doing the work. Yeah, and I know this right. isn't my best, and I, you know, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. And then you look at it the next day or two days later, and you're like, actually, that was pretty good. Yeah, you know, like so, it, <laughs> I I think that our 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 self like the key is to turn off that self critic to get mm -hmm. into flow. And, and however you can get into flow, like I think, it, like you said, uh, it's different for different people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for me, I think it's just about regularity, just doing it at the same time every day. Um, Sometimes things to, that to lower the stakes help, you know, like sort of like if you, if you, uh, sometimes some of the, I think deepest and best things I've written have been ones that I wasn't taking particularly seriously for one reason or another. I was like, oh, this is like some little thing for a friend's anthology. I'll put a lot of in jokes in it and it's just a gag and whatever. And that's like the best, that's the best one. And the one that I'm like, this is the great work, which that's, you know, then that's all tight, you know? But so it's like. If you're a writer, send me a story. Especially writers that work with me years. Say, this is the best thing I've ever written. I know it's really shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not, not what not to say to Alan. <laughs> this has happened where people who I've published before, published for years, and they had gone through some trauma, maybe they got divorced or just something happened, and they hadn't written, and then they write, and it's like, oh my God, this is fabulous. You've got to read this. And I don't tell them it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> In a very nice way. Um, but it's obviously all well, the trauma or whatever they were going through came out in the story, but not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like with scientists, you know that you, you trust the scientists who, who say often, well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like the ones who say, this is absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Right. yeah for sure. Yeah. 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 And I won't name James. Do we have more questions from uh, from the live viewers right now? Throw them, throw them out there. Now is your chance. Amy mentioned that you have multiple creative outlets because you're doing computer computerized art now too. Now. Yeah, I've been doing 3D art. If you guys are familiar with Blender, mm -hmm. um, it's a 3D uh, 
three D rendering software that I I taught myself. There's um there's a lot a lot of uh, uh, like tutorials on YouTube and uh, like CG Geek and Blender Guru. They're like these really goofy guys that teach you how to do three D, and it it's just really fun. And uh, um, you know I, I can't really draw like I I draw very very slowly and not that well. Uh, and you know, like I think you guys, I probably you have these great visions in your head that you want to like actualize. So, so like one way to do it is fiction, and another way to do it is three D art. So, uh, for me anyway. So that that's what I've been trying that's, to do. That's awesome. Some of my stuff, yeah, it's cool. been fun. It's been cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, a way to uh, kind of get through the pandemic and and deal with some of the stress. Um, I've been playing solitaire. <laughs> that works. Yeah, that's not a bad way either. Yeah. Well, I've got enough work. Today. I'm spending and I play until I want. I have this little pegboard game thing <laughs> that I spend huh. a lot of time with. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So, do you guys have any questions for each other? Oh gosh. Um, well, I have one for Ben. Uh, yeah. Just. Um, did you find it, uh, did, did, did you find it a, a writing challenge in any way to, to, to take on this entire novel, uh, in, in which, you know, you're, you're using, uh, uh, gender neutral pronouns, you know, did that, uh, I mean, when you read it, it sounded when 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 you, when you read it, the flow was great, and I, yeah. and I wondered if that was something. I wondered if that was something that you had to like work through multiple drafts, or if it just sort of came. Or well, I kind of backed uh, into it because actually, my initial—I mean, initially, I. So I mean, the, the I, my intention was to have these genders that were really skew. Like they can't. They're hard. You can't exactly map them onto male and female. They're they're they. You know, I, I think what we do in our world is we balance this giant mountain of gender ideology about like hard and soft and the sorts of things one should do and things that are ridiculous if one person does it, but okay if another person does it and so on on this on some like relatively minor biological differences. You know, you know, but we balance this edifice sure. of like meaning. And so I was thinking, well, you know, you could take some other little difference, like sort of the way they do it in this world is they do kind of an APGAR test when you're a baby and they decide based on like how reactive, responsive you are, that you're more sort of introverted or extroverted or whatever. And then they, you know, have this enormous like in, investiture of meaning in which kind of person you are, the fast kind or the slow kind, uh, the Kirk kind or the Spock kind, if you will. And so, um, you know, they have sure. this whole other world of gender. So I, but I initially used he and she when I wrote it. And so, and and actually, I went through several things where initially I had I just was like, well, I'll just arbitrarily assign he's and she because that's easier. But nobody will. But then I realized then then I got some critiques on that and which led me to flip them and use like initially it was he for Stades and she for Bales. And then I flipped them and did it the other way because of the feedback that I got. And I realized how intensely it conditions your reading. Like a, a scene reads totally differently. And for a while, I was actually to keep myself honest, writing in the internal document in Scrivener with in, in with invented pronouns, and then using like a post processor to create two PDFs, one in he, she, and the other in she, he, and then I would read them okay. and they'd, be, they'd read really differently. Oh, yeah, and I, absolutely, yeah. And eventually, yeah, yeah. eventually when we were going through it, it was really my editor, Liz Grinsky, who's here, um, who was like, well, you should just use your own pronouns, take the jump, which I think was like, I, I was sort of lacking the bravery cool. to do that. Cause I was like, is that going to be hard to read? Um, and we went through different iterations of different ones. And I ended up, I mean, I ended up quite liking these. Um, I, I like and they, choice of I, well, yeah. once I got used to them, I feel like they flow pretty well. And it does make it feel like these really are two different genders, not the ones Very we cool. have. Yeah. So. I'm actually writing a, uh, a novella now with, um, a gender neutral pronoun and and you know I, I did a lot of research into which ones I could use and and I, and I settled on on one more for for um, readability than anything because like some mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. you're reading aloud it, it you have to yeah. um, pause I guess so so I, but you know it's it, it the, these things are in, I think a lot of them are in flux right now but it's 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 right. definitely um, 
an interesting uh, topic. Yeah. I've done it in short stories, but I've never tried it in novel length. So, you know. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Hats off to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there goes the phone. There goes mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, phone, okay. Phone's off the shelf to you. <laughs> yeah. I have a hard time digesting it when it, you know, using the new, pro, some of the pronouns. Um, and I know it's just a question of getting used to it. I mean, I know initially when years and years and years ago, um, when everything was supposed to be he and him, everything. I mean, as far as non you know, article, mm -hmm. the, the default was male. I started yeah. to play default female for everything, mm -hmm. without switching back and forth totally in one article. And initially the editors or whatever I was doing it in would, would ask, what are you doing? Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I want it that way. It's intentional. And now, I, and you know, so this is interesting, you know, since I've been in the field, it's changed from that to actually to change the pronouns and making them neutral in some way or just mm -hmm. changing them. Yeah. And used to it. It's just language. Language changes, you know, we just have to get used to it. Yeah, and part of what's going, what, one of the things that I'm hoping will come across if you read the book and and everything is that it's actually they're just as persnickety about gender as we are. They think stades and veils are really different from one another. So they, I wanted to have two. You know, I it's, it, I didn't just want a neutral one. I wanted two very distinct gender pronouns that because they're they think you know veils will be veils and stades will be stades and you know. About those, where did those names come? The where did those specific names come from? Uh, veils and states. Yeah. Um, I yeah. was that 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 went through a bunch of different changes too, and and I eventually I actually was veils instead of veils, but I changed it to match the pronoun, so it's a little easier to connect which one is which. Um, I wanted them to sound like sort of, you know, it's I I wanted them to sound natural, so I wanted them to sort of be Anglo-Saxon one syllable here. sort of uh, simple words that you would that, that feel like they're an intrinsic part of the language and that have a little bit of the flavor of um, one being sort of sedate and and intellectual and abstracted and ra rational and passive and the other one being active and emotional and aggressive and, you know, Kirk and Spock are the two genders. So anyway, I want to, you know, I don't know, but I, I just tried to get words nice. that would have that connotative feel a little bit but but not but feel but feel like they'd always been there i have a question for you too um what is your next project what are you guys working on you go first <laughs> well um i've i mean i've just got those two books out there are there are some new projects in the works for mythic delirium books but they're they're not at a stage where i can talk about them yet which which is unfortunate because i'd love to uh i am looking at uh releasing like if it would be ebook only like an omnibus volume of of csc cooney's bone swans and theodora goss's snow white learns mm -hmm. witchcrafts and uh barbara crafts uh the history of soul 2065 and that's going to be called like uh, a mythic delirium fantasy omnibus mm -hmm. but that's like that's like a total sort of money grab move on my part uh in in terms of um in terms of writing uh i have uh i i have a horror novel that i finished drafting back in january that ties into uh, some of the short stories, actually some of the ones that appear in Aftermath of an Industrial Accident, and also some of the short stories that are in Unseeming. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, creates kind of a Mike Allen verse, which is a very scary place to live, <laughs> I should say. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going, that's like my official next writing project to work on. Uh, I'm also... I'm also working on a, a short story. Uh, I have a series of stories that appeared in Beneath Ceaseless Skies that are all set in this uh, sort of unchanging, uh, very dangerous city called Kalchara. I have another Kalchara story coming that I want to try out on Scott Andrews. Love Scott Andrews. Um, Me too. And yeah, and, and um, 
you know, whatever else I think up, but that's kind of the main stuff for the moment. You know, thank you for asking. What about you, Ben? Um, well, I have a, a, a bunch of things that are sort of the, my, the I, I got the pipeline started again. So I have a bunch of things that are coming out. I just actually this month, uh, cool. I have a story in Asimov's um, that is the character who was, when I cut 40,000 words from this novel early on and like threw out half of it and started over basically, uh, I, I cut the original protagonist and that protagonist, Siob, is now like finally I managed to get a story with Siob nice. out of the cutting room floor, um, which is now, which is just came out in Asimov's. And um, I have another thing coming out in Lightspeed, which is a sequel to uh, to a story, A Siege of Cranes that I wrote like 10 oh, years ago. So there's oh, a, yeah. or no, actually 19 years ago because my daughter was an infant at the time and she's going to college. Oh, wow, that's so, cool. Check that out. Yeah. So, um, so there's a little bit of that that I'm, I'm like re going back to old, earlier things and, and like, and like, uh, responding to them or renewing. Uh, like, I, I, I was for a while. Everything I wrote was in an entirely different universe than everything else. Like, I never wrote a sequel. Now I'm kind of interested in going back to earlier stuff and continuing it. Um, and it's the other fun. thing is, I'm working on. Uh, I'm also working on a project that's sort of um, a, a choice of games game. That's mm -hmm. one of these interactive fiction games. There's a bunch of them on the on the nebula battle a little while ago it's like it's like a it's like a choose your own adventure sort of modernized version of that uh there's a company there's a publisher that does them they're very it's very author friendly um terms and they uh uh there's one uh, max gladstone did a couple of them um and the one i'm doing is set in the shtetl so it's sort of magical jewish historical fantasy um, like the role playing game that I did, this is there's sort of, it's sort of a, uh, in a way, it's a spinoff of that. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's got golems and the books and you know, excellent uh, that stuff. midwives cool. and excellent. matchmakers. Yeah, well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in from folks, so um, unless you guys have any, any questions that you want to ask each other or us, uh, be happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, um, Great reading, uh, absolutely love them both. Uh, let me just throw up uh, some uh, things here. You can get uh, Aftermath of an Industrial Accident by Mike Allen here, there's the link. And also uh, you. on YouTube, the, you'll see the, uh, the link at the bottom there. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, you go to kgbfantasticfiction.org and uh, you can uh, get links to the author's books or just search for Aftermath of an Industrial Accident by Mike Allen and Ben Ro Rosenbaum. You can get The Unraveling uh, at the link uh, below. So uh, thank you both for, um, for joining us. Uh, it was great. Um, thank you, uh, those who are watching live and who are watching the recording of this. Uh, we totally uh, appreciate the support. Um, Definitely yes, thank you. appreciate uh, the fact that we're able to, to keep this series yeah. going during the pandemic and the quarantine and and uh, uh, have have Ben who's all the way in Switzerland and we're, we're having some guests who are- Two o'clock, 2 a.m. for Ben. 2 a.m., yes, thank you for yeah, uh, staying thank up. Thank you guys. So late and thanks for uh, everybody who asked questions. I'm gonna have to answer all of Stacy's mom's questions later oh, in the comments, I think. Oh, uh, you know what, here, here's a question <laughs> that uh, is, is about writing. Uh, that she asked. So let's put that up there real quick. Last question of the night. Uh, I wow, that's a big question. Well, um, let, me, let me read it. Let me read it first. Yeah, for go ahead. Podcast. podcast. Stacey's mom asked, uh, as someone who is a Jewish writer, Ben, what do you think of Jewish represent Jewish representation overall in literature? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. There's there's like a the, the, it's a big topic. That I have a lot of thoughts. It's very specifically about fantasy literature i remember there was a, a this kerfuffle some years ago when in the new in the new york review of books or something there was an article called why are there are no jewish narnias which yes. was sort of about like the the, the you know that the, there would that there was no great jewish epic fantasy and a lot of people went and yelled at them and was like what do you think jane yolen and neil gaiman and you know I mean, what I like a million wrote, peter beagle right epic fantasy i was but, like, I remember that but, I was, yeah. But I did feel yeah. like while while I think the person writing the article was not very versed in fantasy and didn't use the right words, exactly. I did think there was a certain there there in the sense that, of course, there's plenty of there's a million Jewish writers of fantasy. But there's a discomfort that I feel certainly with this with 
kind of Tolkien-esque epic fantasy in which there's one unitary dark evil, which is, you know, um, which is defeated by pure guys with swords. And, and, uh, and so there's, uh, and, 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 you know, because I, because we weren't on the, because when I think of the medieval times, you know, I know which end of the sword I'm on. You know what I mean? So, so there's a, there's a certain discomfort. I'm playing D and D and paladins always give me a little bit of a shiver up the spine because I know who the paladins are coming after, and it's me. So, um, so I do think that's an interesting, you know, that's an interesting dynamic. And I, I kind of, I mean, I've, I've, um, uh, I, that this past online WizCon, I gave a talk on. Uh, Doctor Who as the Wandering Jew, um, <laughs> which I'll post at some point. But anyway, I, I have a lot of thoughts. I don't know if I could sum them up now, but I think it's, um, um, I mean, there's a lot of great Jewish representation in literature, but there's also a, sometimes there's a subtle, um, mis I have felt growing up and reading something, a subtle mismatch between, you know, my experience of the world sometimes and the sort of, you know, the dominant narrative in fantasy. But anyway. yeah. I, I can't address that directly, but I feel the need to mention that the history of Soul 2065 by Barbara Krasnov, the book, that, mm. uh, one of the two books that I published last year, you know, is if, if you if you know, if you are looking for for fantasy with with a Jewish you know perspective, that's I I'm biased, but I think it's a really <laughs> amazing book in that way. Uh, and and you would yeah. hope that you'll cool. seek it out. Stay safe. Barbara Krasnov is an amazing writer, and yes. I really wish that she was more popular because um, she's just so fantastic. And I had the pleasure of her uh, re hearing her read some of the stories um, right. live, and she's just like they were just so good. Like she just captures the characters so well. Like it was just, yeah. I I, I have no uh, investment in that, in that book. I think it's a great book. Um, so I and and I think Barbara's a great writer. So yeah, definitely check that out. Now I do have an investment, but not Veronica Shainis's collection, Burning Girls, another mm, another I, good writer. Yeah. I, oh yeah. Edited, I semi acquired that for tour books, and the two main the big stories in there, novella Among the Thorns, which is taking a grim fairy tale that's anti-Semitic and twisting it around and um, burning girls, which is very much about steadily. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, she's a, a, a really great. Jewish fantasist also. Yeah. She hasn't written a novel yet, but and, you know, not all the stories are about that, but two of yeah. her really important ones are. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, with that note, I think we will call it an evening. Um, thank you. Thank much. you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks thank, so much for this. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thank, for thanks both our, of you. Uh, thanks everybody. Supporters and everybody. Uh, so this is um, KGB Fantastic Fiction uh, hosted by Ellen Datlow and myself, Matthew Kressel. Uh, we will see you all next month. So stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.